So by now you might be wondering, who is this Ivan Pavlov and what's the deal with drooling dogs? It turns out Ivan Pavlov, at least at the start, was not even a psychologist. He was a physiologist. He wasn't interested in the psyche. He was interested in digestion. So he was conducting studies of the role of saliva in digestion. And what he would do was to, um, there's, a, there's a drawing of it here, he implanted a little test tube in the side of each of his lab dog's mouths, and he would look at when the dog salivated and how much. So far, so good. But here's a problem that Pavlov ran into. At a certain point, the dog started drooling just from the sight of the person bringing him the food or from the sound of the door opening through which the person who brought the food always came. And those of you who have dogs know that this is true, right? You pick up a can opener or you open a can of dog food and your dog knows, they get all excited, they start drooling. So Pavlov, for Pavlov, this was a problem. He wanted to study salvation, sal salvation salivation in uh, as it related to eating but here these dogs were salivating before they ever got food there was no eating involved pavlov kept bumping into this problem and being a really smart guy at a certain point he realized holy smokes this isn't a problem this is a jackpot what i'm actually doing is studying learning and so Pavlov changed his research protocol, started studying learning, and got a Nobel Prize for it. Okay, what's the deal? Uh, Pavlov's dogs started salivating when they saw the food that was coming, when they saw the dish. Just the dish would be enough to cause the dogs to salivate. Seeing the person who brought the dish, they'd get very excited and salivate then, or just hearing that person's footsteps. Now. Salivation or drooling is supposed to aid digestion. You can't eat a bowl that you see. I mean, the bowl's nowhere near. There's not even any food in it, right? So what is going on? Well, Pavlov realized that these dogs had undergone classical conditioning, right? Which is a concept that he invented. And what I'm gonna do now is very briefly show you some video from his lab won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly, an inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened. The dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Okay, what is this learning exactly, this classical conditioning? that uh, Pavlov's dogs learned. Well, let's say that the research assistant who was bringing the food came through a door that had a bell on it. So originally, the first time a dog was brought into the lab, a bell would ring and it wouldn't mean anything to a dog. Now, there's a lot of conditioning, they love labels. So you're, my students, you're gonna have to know these terms. When the bell had no meaningful or significant importance to the dog, it's called a neutral stimulus. It's a stimulus, but it doesn't have any, anything important associated with it. It's just neutral. And what is the response of the dog to a neutral stimulus? Nothing. 
No response at all. So before any conditioning happens, the bell is a neutral stimulus. Also, before any conditioning happens, food is an unconditioned stimulus. No one had to teach the dog that food is good, right? No one has to teach a puppy to eat food. They love food. It's automatic. So an unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus that you don't have to train anybody in, right? And it, it, it gives rise to an unconditioned response. So when a dog sees food, it knows, nobody had to teach him, ooh, that's good, and starts drooling. So the unconditioned stimulus gives rise to the unconditioned response before any conditioning happens. Okay, now what is conditioning? Conditioning is just another word for this learning phase. And what happens? The dog learns that the sound of the bell predicts the arrival of the dog food, right? It's just like, uh, your pets at home, right? They may learn that opening a particular closet means, aha, food is coming. So opening a closet, that would have been a neutral stimulus, just like the bell. The food, right, is an unconditioned stimulus. Dogs already know that's great. So what your dog's learning is that the bell or the sound of the closet opening predicts the arrival of the good stuff, the food. So now, that pairing happens long enough, the dog starts salivating to a bell that it can't eat. So after conditioning, the dog drools or salivates just from the sound of the bell. So the dog has learned that the bell predicts the arrival of something good. Okay. Now, I threw around a bunch of terms there and they can be a little confusing. So I just wanna go back and, and tidy up a little bit here. The um, unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same, right? In this case, it's drooling. The unconditioned response and the conditioned response are just triggered by different events or stimuli. Also, the neutral stimulus and the conditioned stimulus are the same thing. In this case, they're both the bell. The only thing that changes is whether that stimulus triggers a conditioned response, whether learning has taken place. So there's some duplication there, overlap of terms. Okay, so putting it all together, before conditioning, dogs know that food is good. Before conditioning, dogs know bells, who cares? They ignore them. Then over and over again, the bell or the sound of your closet cabinet opening predicts the arrival of food, right? The bell, that's a neutral stimulus, predicts the arrival of the unconditioned stimulus, the good stuff. So the dog learns, hmm, that bell means food's coming. So the dog starts to drool in response to the sound of the bell or at home, maybe a cabinet opening. That is classical conditioning. Those of you who have trained dogs with a clicker already, knows what, already know about classical conditioning. So the clicker um, is just a little sound. It's just a little tin, uh, bending of a tin piece of tin that makes a clicking sound. The clicker is a neutral stimulus. It doesn't mean anything, right? But if you get the dog to understand that the click means that a treat is coming, right? So click, here's a treat, click, here's a treat, click, here's a treat. All of a sudden, the dog's gonna get excited about the click itself. So you don't even have to give the dog a treat every time. Because if you gave the dog a treat every time, you know, over and over and over again, as you're trying to teach the dog a new trick, um, your dog's going to get fat. Okay. All right. Here's another example of classical conditioning, and it relates to, let's say, kinks. Okay. Here's the deal. A, a man who's now a professor, um, his first girlfriend, really like to eat onions, okay? So he learned, uh, what? That onions predict sexual arousal. How did that work? Okay, the, the beginning, the onion is a neutral stimulus, right? It doesn't have anything to do with uh, sexual feelings or lust, right? It's an onion, ooh. Um, but getting a passionate kiss from your boyfriend or girlfriend, that's got a sexual arousal component to it, right? 
Now, what would happen? Smell the onion breath, get a kiss, get a little turned on. So onion breath, turn on, onion breath, turn on. That's what happened. So this guy as an adult gets turned on every time he smells onions. Classical conditioning. Okay, here's some examples that I'm gonna have you guys figure out on your own. So students, you can start and stop. But let's say that your partner always uses a particular shampoo that has a particular smell to it. And eventually, just the smell of the shampoo makes you feel good. So I want you to go through and work out what's the unconditioned stimulus, what's the unconditioned response for this one, because that's a classic example of classical conditioning. Here's another one. Um, the door to your home squeaks when it opens. Eventually, your dog starts getting excited just from the squeaking of the door. Classical conditioning, you figure out the parts because you will have to do that on my exams. Uh, you go in for your vaccination, maybe your flu vaccination, and the person giving you the injection says, this won't hurt a bit. And then it turns out it really hurts. And then the next time somebody else tells you this won't hurt a bit, you cringe. But, ooh, you have a reaction, a spontaneous, involuntary reaction, classical conditioning. So students, work out all of those bits. Uh, let's do another taste aversion example. You go to a particular fast food restaurant. Let's say it's a fast food restaurant across the street from your home. You have a burger. Turns out the hamburger was bad and you get violently sick with food poisoning. What happens the next time you walk by that restaurant? Okay, students, complete those. I leave you on that point until we get to our next mini lecture, and that one will involve classical conditioning and making babies cry. Come back.